In high school English, my English teacher said that, you know, when you write an essay, you should put the thesis statement right up front. So that's what I'm going to do uh, this morning uh, with this message. And it's this, God can grow you through what you go through. God can grow you through what you go through. And this message is about how. Now, uh, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt did a, a hypothetical experiment with some people, and he got them together in a room, and he gave them some information on a piece of paper about uh, someone's life story. And these are the details that he shared with them, and I'm going to share them with you. A girl named Jillian would be born in August. She would develop a learning disability that would delay her ability to read. She would struggle through school and get average grades. In high school, she would become best friends with someone named Megan, But Megan would get cancer and pass away. Jillian would be very sad and her grades would suffer even more. She would go to a local college and work at the same time. But a drunk driver would hit her from behind in an intersection. The car swerves and a boy in the car dies. And although not her fault, Jillian blames herself and goes into a deep depression. Eventually, she goes to a state school, gets a degree, and works for a food distributor. But the economy takes a downturn, she loses her job, she looks for work, but needs to sell her house and move into an affordable apartment. She starts living month to month. She finds a new job, but never makes as much money as she did before, ever. She won't be able to retire as she had hoped. She has to work hard into old age, struggling to put her life back together. So those are the essentials of the story. Now, what he did with these gathered people, he says, okay, now imagine that Jillian is your daughter. Imagine that she's your daughter, but she hasn't been born yet. And all this detail is written on a piece of paper in pencil, and they're given a pencil and an eraser and are given five minutes to change details about her life. What are they going to change in those five minutes? And so people start making changes. What do we do? Well, of course, people's first instinct is, well, we want to remove the trials. We want to remove those hardships. But is that always the best thing? Especially when you consider this cold, hard fact of human existence, which is this. Quite often, it is the trials that make us more resilient to deal with the things we face in life. What if Jillian is able to go through her life and overcome so many things because she had that learning disability? What if she was able to have some joy for the various experiences and mountains and valleys, however difficult, because she had that experience with Megan? And yes, Megan died, and that brought her pain and sadness, but what if she had joy for other parts of her life because of that experience? The question is, how? How can we think through our trials and the hardships that we experience, and many of people are going through such an experience now, how can we change our perspective about those things so that we can become more resilient. And that's what this is about. Now, let me be clear as we get into this. I am not saying that trials are great. I am not saying that hardships are good. I am not saying that. I am saying that life comes with those things. Therefore, how can we see them in such a way that we try to be open to being resilient as God's people? Do you want to be more resilient in and through your trials and tribulations? I do. And so that's what this message is about. God can grow you through what you go through. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a text in the Bible, James chapter 1, to see how we can broaden our understanding and how we can become resilient through the trials that we face in life. Let's take a look at the text together. This letter is written by James, the half-brother of Jesus. He was a well-respected and dependable leader in the early church in the years after the resurrection, especially in Jerusalem. He earned the nickname Camel Knees because he apparently spent so much time on his knees in prayer that they became hard and calloused like a camel. Let me tell you, that's the kind of person you want to get wisdom from. James was martyred in 62, so the letter was obviously written before that. His letter was written to a wide audience and is sometimes called the Proverbs of the New Testament because of its understandable and succinct wisdom. An important theme is connecting your faith with your actions, with how you live on a daily basis. So let's look at the text, and I'm so glad today that helping us uh, with the reading of this text is Lindsay Sutton. Lindsay, take it away. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let's pause there for a moment to highlight a few things. So James doesn't say that trials are joyful. He says to consider 
them as pure joy. It's about their attitude and outlook towards these things that they're experiencing, however difficult. He also doesn't say if you face trials, but whenever. He presumes that trials will be a part of their lives. In verse 2, he also speaks about many kinds of trials. So in this letter alone, here's a list of trials he could be addressing. Uncertainty, financial trials, financial exploitation, facing social discrimination, relationship strain, being slandered or judged, physical illness, and deception. And then in verse 3, he says that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So this word could also be translated as steadfastness. Lindsay, back to you. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, The rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. A word should be said about the crown of life. So a crown in the ancient world was a wreath worn on the head as a sign of victory, uh, usually in sport or war, kind of like a trophy. So in this context, the person who perseveres under trial, whatever it might be, will one day receive this sign of victory, which is called the crown of life. So thanks so much to Lindsay for taking us through the text. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Uh, Thanks to Lindsay for that. So in light of this text, how can trials make us more resilient? Okay, so to focus in on some insights from the text, I'm going to highlight a couple key verses here. Okay, beginning at verse 2. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Skipping ahead to verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Okay, in light of that, let's focus in on four details. One, adopt the right attitude. This is really essential. What does the text say? Well, verses two and three, consider it pure joy. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So James, the half-brother of Jesus here, doesn't say that it is really joyful. It's great. Yay. Let's have fun with, you know, this. He says, consider it. It's about perspective. It's about outlook. Okay. It's the opposite of stubbornness. Okay. So here's what stubbornness, and I know none of us are stubborn. We don't know anyone who's stubborn, right? None of you watching at home is stubborn. But but, but apparently stubborn, stubborn people, they're not open to seeing things in a new way. That's the definition of what it is to be stubborn. This is the opposite of that. It's being able to choose your perspective. So James assumes that his listeners and readers are going to be open to seeing things in a new way in this text. Consider it pure joy. Consider this perspective wherein God, we're under God, we're, we're going to be persevering under trial, and this is a God who continues to be good, who continues to provide for us through the ups and downs of life. I heard about this guy who had a heart attack. I forget where I heard the story, but this guy had a heart attack. Clearly not good. That's bad. A heart attack. However, he saw his life flash before his eyes, and so he makes a bunch of changes in how he lives, and he you know, starts living in a healthier way. He starts spending more time with his family and friends. He starts living by better priorities, and a friend of his, after several months, notices these life changes that this guy is going through and goes over to visit his friend and says, hey, how did you like your heart attack? He says, what do you mean, how did I like my heart? It's a heart attack. I didn't like it at all. He said, really? He said, because really since that time, although difficult, since that time, you're you're taking better care of yourself. You're spending more attention and time with the people you care about, and you're living by better priorities. So how 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 did you like your heart attack? And the guy was like, well, I never thought about 
like that, but when you put it that way, I guess I liked it pretty good. Resilient people adopt the right attitude. Number two, be confident that God is shaping you in the long run. Let's look at the other side of that text in verses two and three. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Okay, so we are trusting that God is who he says he is, that God actually does have this power that he says he has and that God is able to work in and through us in the long run to make us more steadfast, to help us persevere as people. So if you think to yourself in the midst of all this, this is gonna crush me or whatever experience or stress or COVID-19 or whatever, this is just gonna crush me, well, then you're setting yourself up for failure. However, if you say, this is challenging, it's difficult, but I trust that God is God that I'm going to persevere with his help through this test to my faith. That's what it's about. People who are resilient are confident that God is shaping them in the long run. Number three, ask God for wisdom, trusting he will give it to you. Okay, what does the text say? Verses five and six, if any of you asks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, He's not just going to give it to you if you have your life together. He loves us. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. So the text is getting at this idea of being double-minded. And so in James 1, someone who is double-minded is someone who has divided loyalties. And so if you go to ask God for wisdom, you're like, well, maybe he won't give it to me. And yeah, yeah, he he may or he may not. The text warns us against thinking like that. In verse 7, it says, the person who does that should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And so, we seek wisdom from God. We pray to God for wisdom. We don't pray to Oprah for wisdom. We seek wisdom from the scriptures. We don't seek it from the newspaper or blogger X, Y, and Z or whatever. We seek wisdom from God through experiences of worship, through counsel with other wise Christian friends, through fasting, these historic practices of spiritual discernment. And we seek God trusting that he will give it to us. He will. Are we open to it? Resilient people ask God for wisdom and trust that he gives it to them. Number four, be loyal to God no matter what. Loyal to God no matter what. Skipping ahead to verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised. And here's a little detail that you almost miss, but this is about those who persevere under trial. To those who love him, It presumes, James presumes that we love. Now, the reason I said be loyal to God no matter what and supposed to love God no matter what is because our thinking is so messed up about what love is today. It's like, oh, it's this warm, cozy feeling. No, no, no. In the Bible, love is close to our idea today that we use uh, for loyalty. So if we love God, we are loyal to God. If we love our neighbors, we are loyal to them. In fact, that we are connected to them and and are concerned in practical ways about their well-being. So are we loyal to God? Do we give God the first of our time, attention, energy, or just kind of like the leftovers somewhere? It presumes that we love God, that we seek his will, that we want to do his will throughout the journey of life. That's what resilient people do. Now, there's a beautiful example of this. It's so inspirational. It's a story that we don't talk about very much. It's in the Bible, the book of Daniel, chapter three. So these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, They're there and they are being threatened with their lives. They're being told and pressured to bow down to these false gods. And they're they're experiencing this pressure, you know, as they stand before one of the most powerful men in the ancient world, King Nebuchadnezzar, and they're refusing to bow down. And if they don't do it, they've been threatened with their lives. They're going to get thrown into a fiery furnace. They're going to sizzle to death. Talk about a wretched way to end your life on earth. And here is what they say facing that. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, love that, but even if he does not, right, because they don't know totally the mind of God, if he, even if he does not, we, will, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods. How awesome is that? Are we loyal to God no matter what? Or really do we just treat God like kind of a casual acquaintance on Facebook or Instagram that we only kind of consult once in a while when it suits us? Be loyal to God no matter what. Resilient people are loyal to God no matter what. The God who will 
be loyal to them in this life and the next through the trials that they face. Okay, having had those four points in mind, we're going to put them up there on the screen together. Okay, I've said God can grow you through what you go through, and this is uh, based on the text. And there's four points that I've made, insights from the text itself. So I want, what I want you to encourage you to do is look at those four points and ask yourself, okay, what here am I doing well and what do I need to work on? So number one says adopt the right attitude. So maybe that's you. You've got a great attitude. Wonderful. You're able to choose your perspective through this. Right? But maybe, maybe you're not. Maybe this is an opportunity for you. Maybe you actually are stubborn and you're not open to seeing things in a new way. And that's what you need to work on. Number two is be confident that God is shaping you in the long run. Okay, so maybe you do have that confidence, right? That God will help you to persevere and that's great. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you've got this defeatist attitude and you think that this is gonna crush you. Well, maybe that's where you need to, to grow. Three, ask God for wisdom, trusting he will give it to you. If, you. if that's you, that's great. You go to God for wisdom. You're confident that he will give it to you. You seek that wisdom. You're open to the ways uh, that he is sharing that wisdom with you. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you don't seek his wisdom. Maybe you just, you, you, you see some stuff, some wisdom from God or some scriptures or some teachings that are biblical and you just don't like them and so you just go for other sources and so that's the challenge for you. Number four, be loyal to God no matter what and some of you and I know you and I see you and you've got this steadfast faith regardless of what you're dealing with, regardless of your work situation, regardless of your stress, regardless of your, your health, all these things, that's great. Some other people right now during COVID-19, they've looked in the mirror, they realize, wait a second, I think I'm a fair-weathered follower of Jesus. And he is this casual acquaintance and I'm not actually loyal to him and who he calls me to be. And so for you, it's gut check time and maybe that's what you need to work on. So do you remember that experiment by psychologist Jonathan Haidt, right? With all the details about Jillian's life and the hardships that she faced. I want you to imagine your own life. Think of what would be on your list Would it be some sort of stress? Would it be a, a relationship breakdown, the loss of a child? Would it be some trauma that you experienced, the death of a loved one, um, some massive disappointment, uh, an illness, a diagnosis, um, some challenge that you've always struggled to overcome? What would be on your list? Now, here's the difference between real life and that experiment uh, that Jonathan Haidt set up. See, in that experiment, people had an erasers and they could change things that they didn't want to be in the story. None of us have that ability to do that. We can't do that. We have the stuff that has happened in life and now, the, although we can't change the details of what's happened in the past, we can change our perspective about how we look at and deal with the things that we are facing. We can alter and influence our perspective God can grow you through what you go through. So I'm about to preach at you for a second. Friends, are you going down? No. Are you despairing? No. Are you defeated? No. Are you done? No. Alternatively, are you going to win? Yes. Are you going to choose hope? Yes. Are you going to be victorious? Yes. Are you going to be resilient in the footsteps of Jesus? Yes, you are. Friends, trials can be trainers and teachers. How'd you like your heart attack? God can grow you through what you go through if you let him. Amen.